All right. Um, so uh, before we officially kick off um, uh, this seminar, uh, there are some heads up for our students. So your microphones uh, will be muted when you join and we'll open your mics uh, at the end of um, our talk for Q&A session. So if you have any questions during the talk, um, you can raise hand and the mic will help um, open your Mac. All right, so um, today is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Elliot Peterson, um, who is a special agent assigned to the S FBI's um, Anchorage field office, a member of Anchorage's computer intrusion squad. Um, he is responsible for investigating complex food nets, high dollar account takeover fraud, and distributed denial of service attacks. Um, prior to joining the FBI, Elliot worked in higher education and served as an officer, um, officer in the United States Marine Corps. He holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from Dickinson College and a master's degree in crime analysis from Tiffin University. With further ado, let's welcome Elliot. Thank you. Okay, well, I've got um, headphones hooked up with a, hopefully a better mic, so I'm hoping I'm coming through clear for you guys. So if I'm not, or I start cutting out, uh, if you guys can just uh, let me know and I can pause and repeat. But what I was hoping to do today was walk you through what was sort of on our end for the FBI, a, a pretty complicated case um, with a cyber subject matter and then spend a little bit of time talking about some of the aspects of criminal activity um, and sort of uh, the criminal communities that this case grew up in because you know what's really one of the things i find really fascinating about cyber crime is that there are distinct sort of personalities communities education levels geographic areas and those places will tend to have a lot of unique um, cybercrime problems. And so DDoS is a very particular cybercrime problem, but then DDoS in terms of botnets and in terms of the Internet of Things uh, is an even kind of narrower sometimes subset, which is really, really fascinating. So I wanted to give you guys some of the context um, behind some of the criminal activity there. And, and sort of my assumption is that, you know, generally I'm addressing uh, students that are interested in maybe eventually doing work in the computer security arena, uh, which I hope is the case. It's, it's a really, really fascinating field. So um, the first thing I, I always like to highlight is that any success that is ever had with uh, something involving computer crime is always going to be a team success. Um, the FBI just does not have enough people with the right skill set to do this stuff on our own. Um, and we're actually one of the better staffed and trained law enforcement agencies, so it's, it's generally like worse uh, a lot of other places. Um, but similarly, there's not generally speaking one company that, that has enough data, that has enough of the right people, that has the ability to stay with a problem long enough to actually truly kind of like holistically ad address cybercrime. And so that's something I want you guys to think kind of as you're heading out of here is that it is really important that you have an eye to building teams and to working cooperatively um, within your specific region and then even more broadly. Um, and, you know, coming out of education, it's going to be really helpful to stay in contact with your professors and, and, you know, to think about dipping back because actually one of the things I'm going to talk to you at the very end is that um, we did have some uh, some input from some academic uh, experts that actually really helped us with this investigation. So um, one of the things I often have to explain up front is, um, you know, why is the FBI Office in Anchorage involved in doing a lot of these cases? And, and the truth is that, you know, I have tended to have a lot of interest in DDoS. I have made a lot of friends, um, including now some of your uh, potentially professors or, or grad students there even at Purdue that have wanted to work on this problem. And it's sort of a hard and intractable problem that a lot of people for a lot of time were dismissive of, but, but it is actually DDoS can be a very, very severe threat. And I'm gonna get into why. Um, and in Alaska, we're really sort of left alone. So I work with four other people that do cybercrime. Um, there's about 45 agents up here and that makes this the smallest office uh, in the, for the FBI uh, in the United States. It's, it's tiny compared to a lot of the other bigger cities, but we have, had the luxury of working on really hard problems and then staying with them 
to completion. So one of the things I want to explain a little bit is kind of what did DDoS look like in 2016? So I'm guessing that as, as an audience, most of you are probably familiar with Mirai. It may seem to you like something that's still going on to this day, and there's some truth to that. Um, but in 2016, when Mirai first emerged, we were not necessarily seeing a lot of IoT DDoS uh, initially, especially at the beginning of the year and even prior to that. It wasn't something that we necessarily saw a lot of. So DDoS, there's a lot of different ways to define it, but the way I like to think about it is you're sending a lot of data to something with a goal of making that something inaccessible. So my goal in DDoS would generally be to make it so that this little green guy can't get to whatever he wants to get to. And then from there, DDoS gets incredibly complicated because you might be dealing with raw bandwidth, you might be dealing with a high number of packets per second, you might just be attacking a protocol that is uh, not very robust and when it fails or the service associated with it fails, you have sort of cascading failures across that device. What's really interesting about DDoS is also that there's a lot of ways, to some degree, for criminals to make money off of DDoS. And that's something that was a little bit new to us um, heading into Mirai, where we didn't have an appreciation in 2016 that there was a core group or audience of people that needed not just the ability to have access to DDoS, but DDoS attacks that were large and powerful enough to take down anything. That was a market that we hadn't spent a lot of time with. And that's because, principally, we've been focused on things like uh, booter services, things like some of the Windows-based botnets, and even some of the earlier IoT variants. Now, I've been part of some teams that have done some really interesting research with um, universities, with uh, experts. Um, there is a Strasbourg University in Germany, I believe, Austria, I think, um, they, they have done a ton of really interesting research, um, their doctoral students around DDoS and come up with some really great findings that we've tried to then use with criminal um, investigations. But one of the things we've been able to figure out is the relative size and horsepower of a given DDoS attack. And so when people talk about DDoS attacks, it's really important to understand how the attack is occurring because that is... Um, will some degree tell you some of the tools that are used, but it's also really important to understand the size of the attack because that can tell you about the also not only the tool, but the underlying architecture that they might be using. So when we talk about booting services, and I'm going to show you some examples in a second, a booting service gets its name because it's a service designed to boot somebody offline, stress somebody's internet connection, and it is generally geared toward home connections, small business connections, and we tend to see bandwidth generally able to be sustained of say one to 30 gigabits per second. Normally pretty short attacks. Um, and if those numbers don't sound scary, sometimes it's perspective. Uh, one gigabit per second may not be a lot of data coming into say the Purdue University network, but one gigabit per second can be an absolute ton of bandwidth when it's being delivered to for instance, like a satellite consumer using Frontier or somebody on one of Comcast's maybe home plans. And so even on this lower range, we find that these tools can be really effective in their intended purpose, which is basically severing an individual's internet connection. And we've actually seen booters used sometimes really effectively against school networks because if they're attacking a specific service or a specific server, then the bandwidth that they can come together and, and grab is sufficient. The next sort of level up generally in terms of um, expertise uh, and complexity would be Windows-based botnets. And a really common one for a while was Dirt Jumper. And Windows-based botnets are pretty interesting. And we had generally seen attacks in the five to 40 gigabit per second range. And a Windows-based botnet means they've got a whole bunch of infected Windows machines that they control and they can force it to push data somewhere. And so you're generally then going to be limited by two factors the processing power of that computer, which for a Windows machine generally is actually not a limitation. Your actual true limitation will generally actually only be the bandwidth of the internet connection. And so then you're limited by how much bandwidth that you could push upstream. And so you can build a bigger botnet, but 
but bigger botnets are valuable. And so there's an economy of scale here. So we haven't generally seen a ton of extremely large Windows-based botnets because if you had the money and skill to build that, there are other people that would probably be happy to pay you more uh, or the machines would be worth more to you than just being used for DDoS, if, if that kind of makes sense. And if, if you guys want me to explain that more at the end, I'd be happy to. We also had started to see um, IoT or Linux-based botnets. And that uh, those were starting to be troublingly large, and we were routinely seeing attacks in the 20 to 100 gigabits per section back in, in 2016. Mariah was about to blow all of those estimates out of the water. And even today, now we routinely see kind of 200 to 400 gigabit per second attacks, um, which is uh, alarming and scary and can cause all sorts of other harm. So what does a booting service look like? At the time in 2016, I was working to try to shut down a bunch of booting services, but the most important one that I was trying to deal with was something called VDOS, which was run by a pair of Israelis, um, which is somewhat common. Um, so booting services, I talked about sort of crime and geography. We tend to see booting services. The audience or the customers are generally North American or Western European. And it's the same for the people that are providing them. This is not something we see that's a problem as much in Eastern Europe um, and even necessarily in China. Um, but, the, but the audience of these groups tend to be sort of really gaming centric and really young. And so this is what VDOS looked like. And once you signed up and got a membership, it, it was as simple to do an attack as to resolve a domain, get the IP, plug it in, pick your attack type, and click go. And VDOS was um, king of the mountain at the time. And actually, at some point, its database uh, got leaked to Brian, the journalist Brian Krebs. And he wrote some really interesting articles, um, if you feel like researching more, talking about the economics associated with VDOS, how much they were getting paid to launch these attacks for essentially not really any expense in architecture. But you also, at this time, had a sort of an explosion in the desire for DDoS, and there was a lot of interest in hiring these services, and most of that activity was happening on a website called Hack Forums. And you've probably heard of Hack Forums. And back in 2016, Hack Forums ran a server stress testing um, uh, marketplace where the owner, Jesse, would actually get paid money um, by people that would advertise their tools. And the VDOS guys and a bunch of other stressing services were all over this, and it's how they attracted customers. Customers would come in with testimonials and talk about how great a product it was. Um, and it, most of this was happening on this website. And this website ended up figuring really prominently into some of the activities surrounding Mirai because of its popularity. And the last thing I want to kind of explain um, is IoT. You know, IoT is a concept I think it has a complexity that is something that we should be worried about in this community because, you know, for a while it seemed exotic, for a while people were really admissive, dismissive of IoT, but what I see now is that you might have 10 IoT devices for every one traditional household in a computer. And so the Internet of Things, right, the way I, I try to explain this to lay people, it's things you don't think of as computers. So your microwave, your um, your Xbox, a bunch of other stuff that, that you don't traditionally think this is not a computer, but it actually is a computer because if it has a network card, it can talk Wi-Fi, it's, it's actually a computing device. Um, and I expect the distribution of these things to only scale more toward the Internet of Things is really going to be the Internet. And that's something that I want to leave you guys with is that if we're already at sort of a 10 to 1 ratio in a lot of houses by the, you know, 5, 10 years, you are going to have 20 or 30 devices on a home network to every one true traditional computer. Um, and mostly they're devices that are running a stripped down version of Linux. The device manufacturer will have outsourced the operating system. Um, they will have gone to a vendor that's gonna have provided something that's, that's pretty quick and dirty. Um, and it'll work well enough for its core function, but almost all of these things were never meant to be directly accessible on the internet. So another thing that I want to introduce you to is um, a group that at the time was known as Protraft Solutions. And these are the individuals that are ultimately going to be responsible for Mirai. They were running a DDoS protection service. It was not making a ton of money, but their customers were um, other sort of gaming subscribers, people doing sort of Minecraft gaming. One of the rabbit holes I had to go down into in this case that sort of surprised me was 
the off-market gaming. So not PlayStation, not Microsoft, but people running their own gaming services. Um, you're probably familiar with a lot of kind of some of the more popular games, but at this time, Minecraft and some of its different variants were very popular. And they were also very lucrative. And so I thought as, a, as an outsider, hey, nobody's making any money. But the truth was top 10 Minecraft game modes that would have been paying no money to Microsoft or Mojang that were just sort of using the free license would, would um, ignore a lot of the rules about monetization and would be popular enough that they could make tens of thousands of dollars a month, especially in the summer. And some top modes were making hundred to three hundred thousand dollars a year from players for almost no expense. And so they would offer their own version of gaming, a twist on Minecraft, but they would also have competitors. And sometimes the competitors would offer a very similar gaming mode. And so this is where sort of the need for these DDoS tools at the scale came in because it turned out if I was running a Minecraft service and I could take down the website of my nearest customer, I would make thousands and thousands more dollars as those customers came over to my service out of frustration. And so that is like a simplification of the underlying sort of economic incentive that, that resulted in a lot of these tools coming out. So you had somebody named Ross Jaw at ProTraff, you had somebody named Josiah White. Ross um, ended up using the nickname Ana Senpai. Um, Josiah White was known as Lightspeed or the genius. Um, and they were providing DDoS protection to a whole bunch of Minecraft servers, but barely keeping the lights on and not making enough money um, for this ProTraff solutions to be viable. And at the same time, the geniuses behind VDOS also decided that they wanted to get more horsepower. So they had a VIP mode at, v at VDOS that was incredibly powerful and popular. People were paying 100 or more dollars a month for access to it, but there was this desire for more. And so they teamed up with a gentleman out of Sweden named Johan Nosman and an American named Zachary Bukta, and they had formed this alliance um, and they called themselves Poodle Core, and eventually they created something called Poodle Stressor. And if this sounds at all familiar, good for you, because this was uh, a very kind of problematic thing that happened in 2016 was this emergence of Poodle Core and Poodle Stressor. So in May 2016, the guys at ProTraff are really struggling. And we, as part of our investigation, were able to seize a bunch of devices and communication accounts and go back and add context to things we weren't necessarily aware of. And so we found evidence of John White discussing this and, and White essentially telling John, hey, an old friend wants to release version two of an old project and his people lined up to fill us up with Bitcoin, to which, you know, we see Ross John respond, sounds illegal. And White says, kind of. And I do like to pause here and explain, this is super illegal. It's not just like a little bit illegal, like totally criminal. The old project, um, Josiah White actually is the guy that invented QBot, which prior to Mirai was one of the more popular IoT botnet variants. There were a lot of people running versions of it. Um, so the two guys are in bad shape and decide that the answer to that is a giant DDoS cannon, and they make the mistake of pointing out that they both fully understand that the activity is illegal. And so that's May. And in June, we see that Poodle Stressor, which also went by the name Rematen, um, is having conflict. And that's really normal in this crime space, the associations and affiliations among these younger offenders. So, you know, if you're a student kind of your age, the like 18 to 25 group, um, they tend to be, uh, they tend to really sort of have trouble staying together. And a lot of that is personality based. They're not very professional, maybe in the development yet. Um, they, they're sometimes people with personality disorders that trend toward conflict. And so specifically, um, Julius Kibamaki, who is another part of this group, a big part of Lizard Squad, Lizard Stressor for a while, um, and has been a, a, had been a problem years before this, he accuses Bidani of leaking the source code for a maiden to Johan Nosman, who turns that into Poodle Stressor. Um, but Donnie, and, and I, I know all this because we ended up recovering, we, had, we work with the Israelis, I'll tell you later on, to search and arrest the VDOS actors, and we're able to get into their Skype messages and, and get a sense of what they were doing, and again, add context to things that we wouldn't have otherwise known about. So um, the first group, Rematen and, and Poodle Core, Poodle Stress, they're starting to splinter, they're starting to fight, 
Meanwhile, White and Jaw have been working about on and off the past month, and White tells Jaw that he thinks they can make about ten dollars to $15,000 a month running this botnet. And that takes us into where Mirai gets started. So this is a screenshot that, of Mirai that actually showed up. Um, the bad guys took this. The IP up at the top, you'll see in PuTTY, that's the uh, C2 IP for a while. Um, they called it a text-based MUD, which is a type of game. Their idea was if anybody stumbles upon this IP and looks at it, this is what they'll see, and they'll think it's just some, some junk service. Um, and then they said, no account, register ProxyPipe. And ProxyPipe was actually a competitor of ProTraft Solutions um, that was actually making money and doing a decent job protecting its, its customers. And they had a really acrimonious relationship with the ProTraft company. And so when they spun this whole thing up, they also tried to make sure that if anybody, especially the FBI, began investigating it, that they would go and look into and, and hopefully arrest the ProxyPipe members who had nothing to do with it. So Mirai is a concept in September 2016 at its peak, represented about 650,000 infected IoT devices, and just about all of them were infected via Telnet, and that's an enormous number. It's a really, really scary large number. Botnets almost never get that big at one time, um, and they were paying for it through these customers, and they would call it a seat, and access to a seat was about $1,000 a month. I'll tell you, they never made as much money as we thought from this. And actually, later on, they found a bunch of better ways to make money. Um, but there were people that were willing to pay them $1,000 a month for access to this, but there weren't necessarily that many people that had that kind of money. Most of the targets were Minecraft servers. And when they weren't Minecraft servers, they were targeting companies that were providing DDoS protection to Minecraft servers. And their peak attack volume was around one terabit per second, which at that time was far and away the biggest attacks that any of us had ever seen. Um, one of the things that made Mirai really unique was the fact that it would use the infected devices themselves to do scanning, which would help protect and hide the C2s. Um, you wouldn't have kind of uh, a simple scanning architecture that could be readily identified. The scanning would all come back to um, innocent people's devices. And they made it work across multiple architectures. And that was, um, not completely new, but, but it was strange to see a group so effective. And so the picture to the right will show you, this is actually a screenshot that the bad guys took at one point, and they were getting a bot count, and it would tell them, based on the vulnerability in the processor type, how many devices they had. And the list, you know, I'm, I'm clipping this, the list went on a lot further. Um, and that was a, a really big accomplishment, and it had everything to do with why it was able to be as large as it was, is because they figured out how to write um, binary for each of the different processor types, and, and they're really intelligent, and it's one of the things that separated them from a lot of the other groups, and it's one of the reasons they got so large. Another thing that Mariah did eventually was it would hunt for and kill competing processes. So it would look for remittent who was the group that became their main competitor and would also look for older QBot versions and it would find those and it would kill those processes. And then eventually a later variant would actually find the Telnet service, which is how they got most of their infections, and they would kill it behind them so that nothing else could come in behind them and get a hold of this device. And one of the things important to mention here is the devices that they're fighting over are DVRs, they are routers, they are things that are publicly accessible that, that in a lot of cases shouldn't be, um, and, and none of these devices really had sort of the horsepower for them to be messing around like they were messing around. And so they, these types of activities could be really harmful for the devices. You could kill the devices and that would happen sometimes. And sometimes they'd reboot and be clean and fixed up and get infected right away, and sometimes they'd be ruined for good. So in July 2016, the Mirai guys now have had about two months, and they've put the botnet together, and they have decided to do something that's pretty clever, which is that they are going to develop a bunch of accounts knowing that these accounts are going to be investigated. And so they set up a whole bunch of new stuff so they can advertise their service, but with an eye toward throwing us off the trail with an eye toward making it so that investigators can't piece the whole story together. And it was very clever and it was very unusual. So at the very beginning of July, 
we see a whole bunch of accounts get created. Um, we see a docs actually be created, which is pretty funny, although the docs was written and published in some cases before these accounts themselves were actually opened up. We see a Facebook account established in the name of Richard Stallman. Richard is one of the figures sort of credited for kind of modern internet, a lot of Linux stuff, and for whatever reason they decided to, to invoke him when they set up a lot of their fake accounts. They established a Reddit account for him. They established a Hack Forums account. Um, and then they established a Gmail account. And they started in July emailing the hosting companies where they located Marais, or sorry, remittance C2s. So they were now hunting for command and control servers associated with some of their competitors and sending abuse requests to get them shut down. Um, and at the same time, the remittance group has gotten Lizard Stressor to work at a really high level, and they have now just gotten credit with a 400 gigabit per second DDoS attack, which is, which is really large. And in August, some really important things happen. In August, we see that um, an IP controlled by Josiah White does uh, the first iteration of Mirai scanning. This is something that was told to us by university researchers that looked and did a bunch of scanning on the internet. They, that was sort of their focus of study was monitoring scans. And what they were able to determine is that the very first scan for mature Mirai came from an IP address, a specific IP address, and we were able to turn that into an IP address controlled by Josiah White. And that was a very important um, place where our case really was able to move forward. And that would have been impossible to determine were it not for uh, you know, a actual research group that had already been looking at this problem generally and then had data to contribute. On the 2nd of August, Mirai is used to attack a company called Host US, which is a, another small DDoS protection company, and they receive an extortion notice from OG Memes. And essentially what's happened is the plan that Josiah and Paras have come up with to make money with Mirai is to attack and extort other people. Um, and they think that, and then also sell seats, but they themselves are launching attacks and asking for one, two, you know, 10 Bitcoin payments from third parties. On the 5th of August, they go to hack forums and they start a post called Government Investigating Router Nets. And they fill this up with a bunch of fake and false information suggesting that there's a new botnet floating out there and maybe tied to some elite NSA stuff and also to try to generate interest for this new botnet. On the 6th of August, we discover that the Vermeiden group is aware for the first time that there is another group that is competing with them for the same device types. So in about the same period, Vermeiden and Mirai, so Vermeiden being mostly the actors in Israel for BDOS, and Mirai being the American actors, Josiah, Ross, and at this point Dalton Norman, they've all figured out that there is a huge number of vulnerable Telnet devices that most of them have very simple default credentials and they're starting to fight over who has access to those devices. And so we see a number of emails throughout August where the Mirai actors are following their maintenance actors command and control nodes around the internet and is successfully getting them abused and shut down. And their maintenance group at first is bewildered because it doesn't happen a lot to criminals where people are doing successful abuse and then they start doing it back. Their maintenance group starts reversing the Mirai malware to determine where the command and control nodes are in order to send abuse requests. This is an example of what the extortion tickets would have looked like. So this would have been host US opening a ticket. Richard Stallman had sent them one and the subject was notice of extortion. And this is the government investigating router nets page. Lightning Bow was an account that Paras Jaw created. Um, and he basically is trying to create a bunch of false information to suggest that this new botnet contains a running wiretap process, which is something associated with an alleged NSA tool leak to try to get people paying attention and to try to get people curious so that he can in turn sell access to Mirai to people on hack forums, which is where a lot of the money was at that time. This is an example of one of the abuse complaints that would have been sent out. Could be a reason they wanted the name Richard Stallman is they hoped it would have been recognized and they would have hoped companies would have acted more, you know, 
or been more responsive, but this is a very good example of what an abuse email should look like. It's clear, it's concise, it shows the problem. In this case, there's a, there's a C2 on this port for this variant, um, and here's how to determine this on your own. And, and they would send these, and they seem so professional that these, these otherwise companies that you would have considered maybe bulletproof or non-responsive would actually shut the C2s down. And so, um, heading into September now, though, things have started to escalate. And in this case, tired of continually sending the abuse messages, the Mirai guys decide that they're just going to DDoS the C2. So, Poodle Corp is the domain tied to the remittance C2. And the Mirai guys decide that what they're going to do is attack it. And the Poodle stressor is using Cloudflare. They're not attacking through Cloudflare. They've figured out the back end IP and they, they've shut that down. Um, but it's, it's a pretty marked escalation because now we see the first example of these guys firing their tools off at each other. The next day, Mirai is forced to move their C2 to a US company called BackConnect. And we found evidence of this in some of their messages. It was obvious that the C2 was in BackConnect at that time. We found evidence of White and Jaw discussing moving it around. And at this time, they had about 142,000 devices. And we see that when Jaw says, how many players? Because they think they're being creative. And White says, 142, but I need to move to back next server. Jaw says, only, why not? It was more than that yesterday, meaning we had more than 142,000 yesterday. And White said, it's probably that other guy killing. Because at this point, both groups were now looking for and detecting the competing infections and killing them off. So on the 4th of September, we see that the Rematen group has already figured out one day later that there's a new Mirai C2. Um, and we saw that because I, we see an email sent from Throd at VDOS, which is one of Vidani's email accounts, to BackConnect, telling BackConnect, hey, you're hosting a C2 and trying to use the abuse process to shut it down. So you know, already we're down to kind of like a one day period is all it's taking these guys to discover the new architecture. But BackConnect is in on it and they know what they're hosting because it's being run by um, two maybe not super bright guys. And so they tell the uh, Poodle Stressor and Aiton groups, they tell Badani, tough luck, uh, we're not going to respond to any of your abuse requests. And so their Aiton group says, oh really? <laughs> and launches a massive attack against BackConnect's entire network. And that shuts the Mirai C2 down, because they're not just attacking the Mirai C2, they're attacking a whole bunch of BackConnect's range. And at the same day, we actually see an account, this is actually an account controlled by Yard and Badani, um, tweeting out the fact that there's DVR processes. So you'll see it says um, Twitter, web client, you've got an IP, that was the actual C2 IP. And what Badani is telling the world is, hey, it's running DVR Helper, because that was the process name on these devices for Mirai. So Badani's trying to put the word out and get pressure out there to get it shut down. So on the 6th, we found evidence of White trying to ping the Mirai C2 to see if it was coming back up. And we also see via Skype logs evidence that Badani and Nozman had called back. Connect. And about a month later, I actually interviewed the BackConnect guy, so I was able to get a sense of what that conversation probably was like. BackConnect said that Badani and Nozman said they were going to continue to conduct DDoS attacks against BackConnect's entire range unless BackConnect quit hosting the Mirai C2. So BackConnect, instead of responding like adults, contacted a U.S. company, suggested they were working with law enforcement, which was emphatically not true, and asked to find information about where the VDOS S website was truly hosted because they were using a anti-DDoS service that obscures the true hosting IP. So BackConnect social engineered their way into the true IP and then initiated a BGP hijack. BGP hijacking in this case is super legal, uh, totally criminal to do something like that. And you can't BGP hijack one IP. They BGP hijacked the slash 24 that contained the VDOS website. And that meant they stole traffic tied to a whole bunch of other stuff they didn't have a right to. And so when this went down, Badani, we saw evidence of him blaming Drake, Bukta, and BackConnect. Now, he used to be teamed up with Drake and Bukta. And at this time, 
Drake had moved over to be part of the Mirai group and Bukta was doing his own thing. Back Connect was very clearly responsible. And we found evidence as this was happening. In this case, the uh, messages depicted here, Ristorini at exploit.im, those are messages sent by Paras Jaw to Badani bragging about the information he got from this hijack um, and the information that they basically stolen. And at the same time, the Mirai guys are still trying to build out the spot that we found evidence that on this date, Dalton Norman had discovered another zero day, which brought 30,000 more bots into the fold. Now, what's funny about all this and why I like to describe this in sequential order is, this is what I work on, but all of this background stuff I wasn't necessarily aware of. On the 8th of September, the very next day, um, I was in New Haven and we conducted a search of uh, the only U.S. admin of the VDOS service, a guy that was using the nickname Red Sox. And on the same date, the Israelis arrested Ite Hurry and Yard and Badani, the guys running VDOS and the guys that were part of Poodle Stress or Poodle Corps. And so um, uh, just a day or two later, this all made it out in the news that this, this group was arrested. And so what's funny about all of that is that what we had essentially done in our actions, because we didn't understand that uh, all of this other context of this war was going on, is we had just cleared the landscape for the Mirai guys. And they kept their head down for a few days, and then they came back with a domain-based C2, which allowed them to move the C2 around through IPs a lot more regularly. They now were able to consolidate all of the devices that the remaining group had had, because those guys are basically done and gone for all intents and purposes. Um, so the botnet got much larger, um, essentially overnight, and we saw them also get emboldened. And so now the Mirai group is um, getting into a lot of online arguments, uh, threatening people, and then using their botnet to enforce those threats. And where this really came to a peak was that on the 20th of September, a journalist, Brian Krebs, um, did a piece on the BGP hijack of the VDOS domain. And particularly that the companies BackConnect and another company called DataWagon had a history of doing these sorts of activities. And it was a good article and it was, it was right on the money and it was a very good perspective and it really bugged um, Josiah and Paras, mostly Paras. And so previously they had only ever conducted an attack using half of the botnet. But this time, for the first time ever, they used the entire botnet to attack Akamai, who at that time was hosting Brian Krebs. And this is the attack that was around a terabyte in sustained bandwidth, um, far and away bigger than anything that we'd really seen before. And it was devastating to Akamai. It caused problems in their data centers all over the world, and it took um, the Krebs' website down completely. And, you know, it's a really frustrating thing for, for Brian because his, his sort of viability, his life is as a journalist being able to post these things. And all of a sudden there weren't a lot of companies that were interested in hosting a journalist that attracted this sort of attention because now Mirai was the biggest DDoS threat that, that anybody at the time had ever seen. A few days later on hack forums, the Mirai kids post the source code. They do that to try to draw attention away from themselves. Their thought is if they're arrested, if anybody finds that they had Mirai source code on them or on their computers, they can just say they downloaded it from hack forums. They didn't post a complete version of the malware. They posted an incomplete version of the malware and they were asking in private messages on hack forums to charge people. They wanted a thousand dollars to create a Mirai variant for them with working source code. And it took about two months before we saw anybody take the source code they, they published, because it was good source code, it just wasn't complete, and be able to turn that into a complete botnet. And so we then saw um, Google stepped up a couple days later offering to host Krebs on security, and Mariah came right back and, and tried to shut it down, attack, attacking um, Google's entire architecture. And they were probably within spitting distance of causing really, really severe harm at Google, but Google for the most part was able to stand up to it. Um, and importantly, that attack included Alaska devices, which is what I needed up here to sort of jump in and be able to do an investigation and go after them. And, and Brian Krebs told Google it was okay to share that data with us. Um, and we were able to work with that, some of the other information to sort of pen in that we thought that Crossjaw and Josiah White were involved in all of this. 
and through some really interesting work, which we haven't necessarily ever fully devolved yet, we were able to prove that they had been involved. Um, and so what we did is one by one, we brought them up to Alaska and we showed them our case. You know, they had attorneys at this point. We brought them up, we explained the investigation and we asked them, do you want to go to trial or do you want to see if you can cooperate? And every single person decided based on the evidence that they saw that it was in their best interest to cooperate. Um, while we were doing this, our Chicago and San Diego offices were dealing with the rest of their remaining actors and arresting others dealing with a bunch of those guys. And so what happened after that um, was that we worked with them to start cleaning up a lot of the variants. And so people they knew were doing, uh, at this point, you know, six months, a year later, really successful jobs of creating Mirai variants and continuing to cause a lot of harm by conducting these very, very large attacks. And so we were able to shut down Satori and, and some versions of Masuda and some of the other kind of derivatives or variants that came along later. Um, and they were able to help us a little bit in work we were finally able to do to bring down a whole bunch of the remaining DDoS looting services. Um, and so last 2018 Christmas, we shut down a bunch of those, um, which meant we interacted with more sort of college students making poor life decisions um, as, as we tried to shut that problem down, um, including a David Bukowski, who's a college student in Pennsylvania, who was running one of stressor as one of his um, projects. And so, you know, ultimately, and some people think unfairly, the Mirai guys uh, were not actually sent to jail. They were all made felons, and they were all sentenced to five years of supervised release. Um, and if basically the idea being at any point in that supervised release, if they mess something up, then they go serve the, you know, entire five-year term in jail. Um, but one of the issues that we sort of have, and I, I don't issue may not be the right word, but with criminal justice generally, um, is that young first-time offenders, judges in America, very, very rarely give them lengthy sentences. Um, and that's true against, across a lot of crime types, except maybe violent crime. And so one of the things that, you know, I think frustrates some people is they think, well, you caused all this harm, you should go to jail for 20 years. And it's true that that's often what they're, they're charged with, but very, very, very rarely do we see people sentenced like that. The second time, and there's very rarely a third time, is when you'd see sentences that are are significantly longer. Um, and there were two really important aspects that people associated with educational um, institutions played in this investigation. And one of perhaps the most important was just reversing the C2, C2 protocol. There's not a lot of people that are very familiar with IoT, with Linux, with Linux reversing, with embedded systems to reversing. And so it took us probably a couple weeks after the first version ride kind of shut down before we were confident that we understood the protocol. But once we understood the protocol, we were able to uh, join every other Mirai variant botnet and receive attack commands, which made every other investigation after that a lot easier. And so that was very much um, a reverse engineering feat. And it was um, employees at Akamai, at Bell Alliant, a few other places that, that stepped up to do that. And then I mentioned the fingerprinting of the Mirai scanning protocol. And that was also really, really, really important. There are some academic researchers that focus on internet scanning and they were able to go back in time and say that Mirai as it existed throughout September, the first time that that scanning protocol um, emerged was tied to an IP address that, as I mentioned, we knew was part of uh, Josiah White's infrastructure. Um, and that was part of the evidence that was able to bring him to the table um, and get him to agree to cooperate and, and plead guilty so quickly. Um, they didn't quit after Mirai. They had been introduced to a bunch of Eastern European actors, and they learned that because of the large number of devices they had, they could actually make far more money and draw far less attention if they ran a proxy botnet and did things like ad fraud or sold access to people's devices. And, and more particularly, people's IP addresses is what the criminals were generally after. And so they were each making per month, by the time I grabbed and arrested them from running a proxy network, they were each making per month as much as they made in, you know, in total in July, August and September is how lucrative um, proxy botnets were. Uh, and so they ended up having to plead guilty to both things, running Mirai and then operating proxy, proxy botnets. I think 
that takes me up to any questions you guys have. So I will, I think, jump out of this screen and see if I'm able to hear you guys if you have any questions. Okay, I'm going to unmute everybody's mics and you can mute yourself um, if you don't have a question. Hi, Dan. Oh, go ahead. I had a question. I had a question. Um, first, I, first, I really appreciate, I, I really appreciate um, all of your all background of your experience. experience. Uh, I remember growing uh, up through all of it, um, and it was a really crazy um, time. Um, uh, I had a question I to ask you. Since, since most of these devices were done on, 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 like, since most of these devices that were targeted were all commercial, commercial devices, devices, is it is it plausible, plausible in the future to basically, future to basically take these devices, these devices and, and work with the companies with the that company have most affected most to basically have a reset and a quick reset status of the devices, devices um, to basically um, reset basically those reset. default credentials um, and kind of mass secure those devices that were affected based on like a per company infrastructure since all of those devices were owned and updated through those companies? Yeah, so really good question. Um, you know, to some degree that becomes, at least in the U.S., more of an FTC or FCC rule. It's funny, we solve this problem with Wi-Fi routers, right? Every Wi-Fi router now comes with a completely randomized, unique Wi-Fi password on them, and yet that only matters if there's an attacker within, you know, 50, 100 meters of your house, right? Um, so we have worked with some, Huawei was a frequent offender, there's a bunch of others. It's, it's the, one of the issues with IoT is, is that it's very hard to have the firmware auto update, and then it is really, really hard, like, to catch vulnerabilities later and fix it, because most people are running IoT for most of the devices in the same condition it left the factory four or five years ago, right, or 10 years ago in the case of some of the stuff. Um, so we have tried, and some device, some manufacturers are doing a better job, but like, you know, a lot of where I was was an indictment of Telnet. No one used Telnet, but a specific version of BusyBox Linux that a ton of manufacturing companies were using as a basis for their products had it on by default with an admin admin password. Uh, so there's work being done, and it's a really good question. It cuts to the heart of, I think, a lot of the IoT problem, but nobody has solved that yet. Some companies are doing a better job, but I think generally that's we're not out of the woods yet. Thank you so much. You know, a lot of these uh, you know, the offenders you find, uh, you find many of them are fairly young, and if so, is, any thoughts on you know, on how we might educate people about the uh, kind of the hazards of of doing these things, and you know, kind of yeah. I mean, I, I think again, really relevant question, right? So you've got these offenders are young. DDoS offenders tend to be younger. That's not true across all my crime types. Like I also do a lot of the FBI's botnet work. And, and there I'm often dealing, like in terms of Windows-based botnets account takeover fraud trojans, now I'm dealing mostly with really sophisticated Eastern European actors, right? So totally different motivations a lot of times. Um, we, in this case, very much tried to work proactively with the offenders post guilty plea to try to get them rehabilitated. And it's been very successful in a way it hasn't been with other offenders we've arrested subsequently for similar offenses. So a lot of times, like one of the things I have trouble explaining with Mariah is like, yeah, it may look from the outside like they got a good deal, but they work their butts off to justify that. Whereas I've arrested a bunch of other people since then for similar crimes that have totally messed it up. You know, they're in jail now before even being sentenced because they're having so many problems. So 
The federal system is tricky, too, because in the federal system, everyone's an adult. We don't have a program for younger guys. So most of the time, we're only looking for subjects or bad people that are 18 and up. If we find out they're younger, we'll send the locals to deal with them. Um, I think generally one of the messages that's not well understood with DDoS is that it's, it's absolutely criminal. It's just something that was very hard for us and attorneys to fit within the statutes for a while, and we've solved that problem. And so it's super illegal, but you still have a lot of people thinking, well, if I'm conducting a DDoS attack with somebody else's tools, it doesn't sound my fault. Or like, I'm running a DDoS botnet, but it's the customers that are at fault. Well, if you're doing it on behalf of the customers, it's a conspiracy, right? So that's a federal offense. If you're doing it with devices that you shouldn't have access to, like any form of botnet, that's a computer hacking offense. So that's a violation of US 1030. Um, and if you're doing an amplification-based attack with a booting service, you're stealing bandwidth from everybody you're spoofing against, and that's a violation of the law fraud statute. So there is a degree of education um, that needs to happen. And to some degree, I mean, I think the other part is some people are lucky and they grow out of crime and grow into a role in the security community and come around before I've had to interact with them, and that's great, because if they don't, then they end up being a felon. You know, and that's, that's just sort of how it works. And Elliot, this is Krasi. I just wanted to, to remind you how the um, Hack Forum's admin uh, worked with the NCA and had posted for close to three months a notice educating people that booting and DDoS is strictly illegal. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. And a lot of it, it comes from the schools, right? The, you know, it's, it's our job as educators to, to, to be con conveying that message as well. Although, I, I, how many of these have reached uh, university level uh, kind of before they're actively involved in this? All of those three? Uh, I mean, I think three of them, right, Elliot? Yeah, they were all going to schools. Um, you know, I think, uh, no, and that's not true. Two of the three were going to school. One will still finish at the university he was at, um, Ross disenrolled from Rutgers and doesn't plan on going back, but he had he had separately um, attacked the university network in a really sort of devastating way using Mirai and some other variants over the years, um, which is part of ha part of the way we were able to catch him is that this had gone on for a while. Um, so yeah, they, they were, and I mean, we've seen that a lot in the booter space, right? I mean, like I've got, a, is where I'm trying to track down the last few remaining booters. I mean, they tend to be college kids that are in computer science programs. They're really interested in this stuff. And some of it's they just don't think that they can be caught. Um, this really is an area we should be working in, doing things like this seminar. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, probably, and I, I didn't get this in my computer science program, but there really probably needs to be like an ethics program that guys get right away because part of being a computer scientist is sort of understanding all of these avenues where you can take shortcuts or get information other people don't have. And, and I don't think we get enough training in terms of what is legal or illegal, but maybe more importantly, what's generally right and wrong. Uh, I had another question. I come from, I have a club that I run on campus with a couple of lot of members, um, and we're a big CTF team. Um, we're seventh in the nation right now. So a lot of people that come in, um, we get some guys that are easily recognizable as um, like younger script kiddies that kind of don't have that moral fiber or ethical background and they kind of think they're invulnerable um, and I think a lot of the internet, internet culture and hacker space has kind of just taught them that they're kind of invincible. Um, and I think yeah what you brought up if there's a class or something or like a cultural shift that'll kind of push these guys in the right direction. I know a lot of them and seen people grow up and seeing that they've kind of just completely flipped to white hat once they've got a good education and a background that where they understand the infrastructure and they understand that. I've seen them kind of just switch and I think that also comes with some maturity. Um, 
I can I can see it as a problem for new script kitty younger kids coming in. Yeah, I mean, I, it's great, and I think what a lot of the guys need is, a, you know, Discord and some of these places like they they can be. You know, you pick the skills up, but if you want to pick the skills up young, you're not around anyone in the world basis. And so it's one of the reasons locally we've been talking about internships or ways to sort of identify guys like you're seeing that are coming into your CTF and pull them in a direction where they sort of get the mentoring. They get the skills and the context of how you're supposed to apply it as a defender. And look, I mean, I'll say like a lot of the time, I mean, this culture of internet anonymity, like they're not wrong. You know, I mean, if, if Rossi and I don't come looking for you, you're probably not going to get caught with certain crime types, right? And it's, it's, it's a general problem where we have to continue to people in um, sort of law enforcement or even the community or the, the security students that really understand stuff. Um, so my hope is it gets better over you. And I don't think you have enough. That's awesome that you got a way to sort of steer them. Steer them. So, you guys just lose audio? Or? I'm listening to things. I'm listening to things. I think it's figuring out who to mute. I think Jerry was working on it because I kept muting myself to make sure it wasn't coming from me and getting unmuted instantly. I would say if everybody mutes right now, the person that doesn't mute is the person that doesn't pay attention to the call and is not listening. More minutes if anybody else has got questions. Oh, well, Elliot, I'll do a shameless plug. I'm uh, working on a DDoS class, which will probably be available in the fall. It has to go through an academic committee first, but um, there will be a lot of interesting work in that space, uh, including writing defense tools and tech tools. Yeah, I mean, I, I think. You know, generally, and, and Cross and I probably agree, like, DDoS is just one of those things that's sort of wildly underestimated and misunderstood by a lot of people. Um, and, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of companies that are in the space of providing defense that, that need people that understand it or won't understand it. So. Yeah, and actually, with the tools and the defenses, you get to learn so much about the network stack that the skills you get there basically can, can get you a job in a you know, on, on all companies that develop um, routers. So it's a good investment of time. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, I, I'd say a plug from us is if, uh, you know, we do offer internships. If you guys apply, it's through USA Jobs. Um, I'm sure this summer's full, but next summer, you know, if you guys want to come work for us or, you know, work around the school. But, you know, I never planned on being involved in security field. And it just worked out that way. And as long as you're willing to learn, have a lot of fun and do some some really interesting stuff. So, Elliot, uh, can you tell us something about criminal proxy infrastructure? What you are what are you observing and so on? And that's sure. more. Of yeah. So I mean, I think sort of loaded. I mean, proxies are also a field that are sort of wildly I think underappreciated and understood. So. If you want to um, anonymize your online activity, you've got some choices. And probably the most common um, tool that I think like everybody understands is Tor. You know, I, I look at Tor as Tor is a version of a proxy or VPN. It's, it's a tool for um, anonymization. Um, but Tor has a lot of failings in terms of how criminals like to interact with the internet because you can't necessarily pick a specific geolocation. And the way a lot of internet tools are built geolocation of the IP you're coming in on can be really important for um, your criminal scheme. Um, but also uh, latency, bandwidth, type of IP and carrier, like just Tor doesn't give you control over those things. And so 
if you want control of those things, you can go to legit third parties, you can go to NordVPN, you can go to a bunch of other places, but to the end of, at the end of the day, all those companies to some degree have logs, or you might be in a situation where you're on a public IP, so there's sort of reputational problems because you're sharing an IP with a bunch of other people. And so right now, one of the things that a lot of criminals are doing is looking hard at the IoT space because almost all IoT devices have good SOX 5 libraries built in. And so if you can get root access to the box, it's very trivial to turn it into a, um, a good SOX 5 proxy. And, you know, the idea then is why not commit to crime from proxy or from, from Crossy's router at Crossy's house because it's, there's not going to be necessarily logs connecting to it. And so that sort of in a nutshell is the criminal proxy problem. Um, it's a big problem. It's sort of hard to unpack and unravel. I'm not going to tell you we're making a, a, a ton of headway. You know, I, I just, uh, we just indicted a guy out of Estonia for running one of those in Alaska. I mean, he was targeting all over, but we got a guy up here on his way from Estonia who will likely plead guilty for running a proxy botnet, um, which he was using HTTP for the protocol. So it was awesome because I could run Wireshark on the infected devices and see the connections and, and put it all together. Most of them aren't, aren't necessarily doing it that easily. Um, does that kind of answer your question, Crossy? It's like we could talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was more like an overview, just uh, because I don't think people will really appreciate that 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 problem. Right. They're like, ah, oh, what well, proxy? What? Well, it's not a big deal, but then it can end up messing things around attribution. May even end Absolutely, up wasting yeah. somebody's a lot of time. Uh, like for example, somebody's let's say downloading, let's say child pornography from a particular IP address. Right. They go in the house, and then turns out that their machine was just compromised. And, so one uh, thing, I, yeah, I didn't mention is that one of the one of the other things the Mirai actors did is when they were fighting in the middle of September with all those third parties, they were doing all of that from an IP tied to a residence in France. They had popped an XMBC media server there, and they were using that for all of their stuff. And that the, the young man who lived in that residence ended up getting raided by French police because of that tie. So, um, and we were able to unravel it and the router, the XMBC service we were to look for it had phenomenal logs that, that totally implicated these guys. Um, but we knew to look for that and I, you know, it wouldn't be the case in I think all, all instances, so. Elliot, we have a question here and sorry if this has already been answered, but it's from BJ. Um, BJ asks, uh, you mentioned the BGP attack towards VDOS was illegal. Mm -hmm. um, is a retaliatory attack kind of like a self defense? So is there like so the problem? Yeah, it's a great question. That's what they invoked, and it just it's 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 patently not. So if you think about a BGP hijack, you are going out and you're fraudulently telling people that a specific IP range is actually controlled by you and should be routed through you and your peers. There's no retaliatory reason you could ever do that because it amounts to wire fraud. You are stealing something that belonged to And the other thing is they didn't just steal. I mean, if there was a way for them to BGP hijack just VDOS's IP, fair enough, still would be illegal, right? But they took an, a slash 24. They, they, they hijacked, you know, 254 other unrelated people's IPs and websites to do that. Like, it's super illegal. They, you know, they got attorneys. Their attorneys agreed with me that it was illegal. <laughs> so, um, hi, Elliot. Uh, I'm VJ. I, I was the guy who asked that question. Um, so, wouldn't you say that uh, since uh, VDOS had uh, they they performed a DDoS attack on their servers, and so won't that be a sort of like self defense? Like, I want to prevent uh, these guys from sure, compromising. You've been but I mean, okay, so let's use that logic to something. So somebody, um, you know, it's like somebody breaks into your house, right? Can you go burn their house down to prevent them from doing it? Right? You just don't have the traditional defense means on the internet. I mean, I, I, I do understand your perspective, but totally illegal the way they did it. A BGP hijack means you are going out and lying to registries and other services about something you you don't have the right to do that. You have to complain to us or the police or submit an abuse or work within that process. You can't do it on your own. I mean, if yeah, you want to argue that because of that, you launched a retaliatory DDoS from your network services toward their IP, 
like it's still bad, but there's actually like legal different. And I'm not advocating you ever do that, but there'd be very different legal implications there. That, you know, might mean you had slightly more of a basis in the extremity, but you don't have the right to go steal something that's not yours, even if you think it's a defensive thing. And in this case, when they did it, the Mirai kids knew they were doing it and were stealing servers and credentials and other things coming from all these other slash. I mean, it was it was just a mess. It was a super mess. Um, so, um, essentially, so essentially, essentially uh, you'd say that um, uh, it, it was like uh, shooting into a crowd, into a but crowd, your target uh, is just one among them. Right, and shooting into a crowd is illegal, right? I mean, like, it's, it's, there's not like a, you're, there, it's just, it's not even like acceptable self defense in that case. So, yeah, and I mean, it, in their head, they thought it was, and they, they tried to explain that to me, and I read to the back of that guys the, the US statutes, it makes it super clear it's illegal to do all that. Yeah, and, and yet, just even if we go in that example, uh, uh, self defense uh, would only be, used if you are actually protecting your life or somebody else's life and only then you can actually take some action just to just to uh, decrease the level of aggression here in this case we're talking about property that is being denied of service you you absolutely have no business in doing that this is what the law enforcement agencies are for yeah it's just a hard space because I, I do get where you're coming from um, and i would have had more sympathy too if they weren't doing it also for criminal purposes um, so, uh, we, like, uh, so it is basically a, an illegitimate way of protecting their business. Yeah, right. You can't BGB hijacking is illegal, right? You, it, illegal. There's just, and so and so like it, it's not an okay self defense means because it's totally illegal, if that makes sense. Um, um, so, so moving on to the next question from that, uh, how how would you pr protect yourself from BJP BGP hijacking? It's because it's just a, yeah, that's a, a good point. So you need to watch. And you, so that's a good question because we see more of it. Um, you know, whoever your sort of advertised peers or carriers are, um, you want to watch for that. Most of the BGP hijacking activity I see generally has to do with theft of out of use um, IP ranges for monitor gain. I don't tend to see a ton of it um, happening to legitimate businesses with actively used IPs. And when it does, the, the, the routes are often not ever fully hijacked. They're just messed up in certain regions in the short term is what happens. So, but it is something you want to monitor for and react quickly to to fix because it can be a big problem um, if that happens to your network. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, so would you say it's possible to protect the, uh, the, the routing servers? Well, sure. Like, let's say you're in the U.S. and you've got a good arrangement with all of your peers and everything else, but you could still percolate a fake BGP announcement if you could find someone to do it. And, it, you know, and it could still mess up routing for a while, even if it didn't get all the way back to you and your normal routes, right? It could still mean in a region of the world there was a problem with your stuff and somebody tried to do a hijack. And I think, I mean, just it's one of the problems sort of with the BGTP protocol generally is that um, people can kind of initiate it in weird areas. And like I said, we don't see a ton of it. And when I do, it's almost always because someone's actually trying to steal that IP range to resell it because it's been out of use for a long time. Okay. Uh, so uh, so the, my last statement is that uh, so, it, so we, we can have a consensus on um, it's basically very difficult to, to prevent uh, a BGB hijack. I would, I would say yes, but it is also not that difficult to get your ranges back if it happens usually quickly, but sometimes 24 hours of traffic being messed up is enough to cost your company money. I understand. You, it'd be a good question for Chris too. I don't see a ton of it. Yeah. Um, and I would say it is, it's hard to fully prevent, but I think most of the implementations, it's, it's annoying more than anything. Unless you've got a business that's particularly affected by a short-term disruption. And Elliot, the current practices are uh, signed RIRs, so RPKI, and BGPSEC. Yep. And if you're going to a bad provider, you may be hijacked because they, they're not doing their job. Uh, yeah. so, so there are technologies there, but it's the, the problem is that not everybody is implementing them, and the ones that are not, they're the ones causing the problems. Right. Because even if somebody, like for example, if you're coming from a provider that's doing their job, uh, there may be somebody that is a weak point, 
and uh, somebody may introduce the inject through there. So if your provider doesn't have, and other providers don't have proper incoming filters to actually filter that announcement, they may listen to it. Okay, so, so uh, we could basically um, filter out, say, uh, by group of IPs. Let me assume that the the prefix of the IP addresses we can we can filter out um, the and make sure the routes head to only certain prefixes. Yeah, it, 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 it's, a, it's a nano question. There's a lot of companies that are sorting through this at the network side to deal with this a lot. Um, and I think Crossy could get you some really good points of contact if this is something you want to follow. This is Jerry. Uh, I see that uh, I think uh, Arslan Khan has been patiently waiting with his hand raised in the in the attendee list. Uh, Mike, can you unmute his microphone and, and Arslan, if you have a question, please ask and we'll probably have to wrap this up. Sure, thank you. Uh, so I actually had a question about the protection against me, right? So the, the attack was possible because uh, the telnet passwords are just too easy or were too easy. But uh, if you think about the actual problem, like the basic problem, it's still out there. Like people don't update. There are probably like a lot of routers still having admin admin as their password. So besides the DDoS being illegal, what else is out there? Yeah, like so what else is protecting another Mirai? So you, right. So one of the things that's happened post Mirai is that you've got a lot of variants, right? So when they posted the source code, an unintended effect of that was that they also posted a bunch of the vulnerabilities they were using. And so suddenly now you had 10 or 20 different people trying to use the same botnets. And so the space has gotten crowded again, which means that it's rare for anybody to have a lot of devices. And so that's sort of an artificial constraint. When we arrested the VDOS actors, we didn't have any idea about this other activity that had been going on a couple of weeks before. We didn't know how tied the poodle stressor they were. We didn't know that we were completely clearing the landscape for the Mirai actors. So currently, the IoT space is really fractured and you've got a whole bunch of botnets that are not hitting that hard. Um, so one of the things we pay a lot of attention to is when we see bot counts or we see a ton of vulnerable devices, we pay attention. And this has come up a few times since Brian. We've worked with device manufacturers. We've worked with um, protocols and, and, and tried to address that. Natting helps a lot, right? If you think about the IoT problem at your house, if you have all of your devices behind a good, robust firewall, you're in pretty good shape. So that's another way that this is often sort of mitigated. Um, we tend to see uh, bad architecture a lot of places in Asia. So a lot of these, um, a lot of the vulnerable devices from Mariah were coming out of Huawei, DVRs out of, out of Asia. And I forgot to mention one slightly interesting thing is that the DVRs themselves had really good processors because they were used to handling video codecs. And so they could actually push data at the full pipe speed, whereas a lot of other IoT devices can be artificially limited by the processor and will often die in the middle of a big attack because they can't keep up with the demands of the instructions to keep pushing out packets. Um, but your question is a lot like I think the first one, it's still a problem. We're still working on it. It's definitely um, a space you got to pay attention to because I will never be able to force people at home to update their 10 year old devices. And so those devices are getting abused all the time by a bunch of different actors. But it's when you have a huge consolidation that the attacks get really dangerous and really large. Okay, well, this is Jerry. I think we'll uh, we'll we'll call this a day. Elliot, thank you so much for presenting today. Obviously, a very popular session and a popular topic. So, I really appreciate you uh, uh, winning the award for probably being the farthest uh, away person to to uh, present at one of these since we started these uh, online. So, anyway, we really do appreciate it, and uh, we'll have this posted uh, online in a week or so. And uh, again, everybody have a good evening, and, and thank you so much.